Desperation had blanketed the battlefield, every bit as thick and noxious as the columns of black smoke which strafed across the shattered avenue. Deadly sisters of the Imperial Faith butchered and burned their way up the clone lines, and the clones responded with roars of defiance and lots of missiles and mortars. But the results were far from deadlock. Both sides had only ever known war. Both sides had become utterly dedicated weapons of their state. But the clones were barely teenagers, and the sisters were not. Some as young as 20 standard years, some as old as 150. And most varied densely between them. The daughters of the Emperor did not lack for time held within the forges of unceasing war, and most were cruelly tempered by it already. One side bore a distinct weapons and experience advantage, which was proving difficult to overcome as Sando was sadly learning. He and a line of hastily assembled troopers were desperately trying to hold back the advancing Sisters of Battle, their blasters hot in their hands, even as they sought to discard them for heavier weapons. In this, Sando had been fortunate, his long-barreled blaster rifle slung over his shoulder, enabling him to securely hold the DC-17 grenade launcher configuration he had been loaned by Sev before he and the sniper had been separated. Sando and the other clones stood in a dense mob, crowding over each other on a slope of slag and stretched broken steel. Behind them were the remaining ATTEs of the Vanguard, blasting and firing away as best they could with their heavier weapons. Before them, the screaming advance of the Sisters of Battle. Their forces holding sword and mace aloft, some carrying flamethrowers and others bearing what Sando could only describe as super flamethrowers. It was these that he and the others targeted first. Some of the ATTEs had the good sense to prioritize those targets as well, and the worst of the fire flinging units were successfully pinned down or blown away before they could come into effective weapons range. The others, however, were not so easily stalled. Grunting, screaming, and singing in voices meant for murder, the mob of armored ornate butchers came forward with blazing and sparking weapons of archaic war clutched in their hands. Swords of lightning flashed, turning the dwindling rain into hissing mist. Maces crowned and coronas of fire thrummed in the air as their wielders and their sisters stomped upon and shattered the dead and dying in their path. Sando put his exceptional training and instincts to the test, pulling the trigger on his launcher and firing 400 credits worth of explosive death straight into the armored face of a sword-wielding warrior, blowing most of it away. The woman fell, feet still kicking as she tried to continue her charge, and was trampled by the sister behind her, who crawled over the fallen like a vicious beast, her eye lenses red like blood fury, her voice a thundering hymn of hatred. Sando's hands moved quickly, sliding the next to last grenade in his arsenal into the weapons chamber, but the sister coming for him moved even faster. He ducked her horizontal swing, ignoring the two clones to either side of him, both of whom seemed to burst and blow apart like party poppers as they were struck by the arc of her weapon's attack. Instead of dying or noticing their deaths, Sando bit and pierced his own lip, hardly holding himself back from the suicide of shooting her with his grenade launcher at point-blank range. 
Rising in a rush of strength born from the fear of sudden death, the clone warrior elbowed the woman's helmet as hard as he could, his white shell cracking as it jarred her ceramite chin. She staggered back slightly, recovering swiftly as Sando slid the handle of his DC-15 into his waiting grip, using his shoulder strap to steady the long barrel. His muscles knotted and burned as he hefted the weapon with one arm and jammed its nozzle into the crease between her shoulder and breastplate. He had milliseconds to act, and luckily, the blaster had already been set to maximum output. And as he pulled the trigger, a bright blue flash filled the shoulder of her armor and the warrior released an agonized scream as she began to convulse at the end of his rifle. Her voice was terrible to hear, but far worse were the death cries of his brothers, and Sando spared her no pity as she tried to pull back off his barrel, the clone keeping the pressure on and firing again and again. The armored sister lost control of her weapon arm, the limb spasming before going limp and releasing her fiery mace, letting the active weapon fall to the broken steel beneath them burning and pulsing with deadly technology as it rolled down toward the base of the slope they stood on. She made to reach for Sando with her one good arm, her hand formed into a vicious claw meant to grab and break the white-armored body of the clone. But he stepped inside of her grip, shrugging her hand off as he slid one of his feet behind hers and shoved the woman's flailing bulk backward. The sister fell hard and slid partway down the slope on her back, clawing at the broken ground with her good arm before Sando silenced and stilled her with a blast from his grenade launcher. But even with that, the work was far from done. He had hoped that their defense would shove the sisters back to their own lines, but as it was, they had barely forced them down the slope, and already the bloody Imperials were rebounding. Sando let his blaster rifle hang from its strap, reloading his launcher before tapping his helmet and activating his comm channel. He hoped that now that the rain had died down to a drizzle, and the main column of the Republic forces would be closer than before, someone somewhere would hear him and help them before it was too late. Vanguard Frontline needs reinforcements! We are being overrun! Repeat! We are being- he began to report before cutting himself short to grab his grenade launcher with both hands. They were upon them again! He fired between two running Imperials, knocking them both aside and hoping he had done more than stagger them. His next act was to throw his launcher into the face of another, blinding the growling warrior woman enough to duck the horizontal slash of her sparking sword. As he handled his DC-15 once more and jammed it into the joint of her sword arm, now swung wide. He fired, once more disabling the targeted limb, though the sister did not release her weapon as the arm went limp. Her servos jostling and seizing as she screamed fury into his face. He tried to fire again, but the armored joint he had targeted locked up and broke the barrel of his entrapped weapon. Releasing his now useless blaster rifle, Sando spun around and took her weapon arm by the wrist just as she grabbed the back of his armor with her free hand. He twisted free her burning weapon with a hard, wrenching motion, catching it out of the air before it finished falling. Ignoring the scorching heat he felt in his hands as he was yanked back, Sando thrust behind himself with his now stolen sword and impaled the woman through the chest with it. The Imperial fanatic breathed blood into her helmet, her free hand still locked onto the armor on his back, ripping free the white shell and mechanisms there as she collapsed and fell off the end of the sword. The clone could feel no pain and knew she had crushed the magnetic weapons locks on his armor and hopefully little else. But Sando had barely a second to judge the potential damage. Another came for him, almost trampling the first, but Sando drove back the new, mace-wielding assailant with wild swings of the dangerous weapon. This warrior seemed far more wary of the clone than the previous ones had been, and approached him with the steady cadence of a predator. Sando was one of only a handful of men left, and even the tanks behind them had been largely incapacitated by the exchange. 
having become the targets of the thundering Imperial weapons known as Bolters. Still swinging the sword in a desperate warding gesture, Sando's eyes swiveled around in his skull, his brain cooking in desperate, furious calculation. The scissors drove in and, once more, he narrowly avoided death as he whipped out his blaster pistol and shot the ground beneath her feet, causing the rubble to melt and slide under the Imperial's boot and buy him seconds more. He looked at the surviving clones around him and gestured to them with his blaster pistol. Fall back! Fall back! Fall back! He yelled to them. In response to his orders, another sound answered. The warbling roar of LAAT engines. The gunships flew overhead, strafing missiles into the body of the enemy assault while more precise blaster cannon bolts hammered the line where the Imperial forces met the dying borders of the Republic's defense. The results were rapid and violent, creating space between the warring lines in the blink of an eye. But it was only the beginning. Already, Sando could feel the thump, thump, thump of advancing ATTEs, and soon, modified ISP speeders came into view, towing sleds full of fresh troopers ready to dismount in moments. The main column had finally arrived, and the primary engagement of this battlefield had at long last commenced. But, the Imperials were less than willing to allow the Republic a moment to rally, and Sando found himself stumbling back as columns of fire and smoke arched up from the savage horde of the Imperium. At first, he thought them to be some kind of weapon, rockets, or mortars that the enemy had lobbed towards them. Soon, he saw that it was far worse, for these were no mere munitions, but sword and flame-bearing warriors. Sisters of the screaming faith of the Empire, descending like angels of death born on hellish black and red wings. They slammed down into the Republic line, crushing clones beneath their feet and wasting no time at all before they resumed their slaughter. One came for Sando and he scrambled back, not in any position to defend himself adequately. The clone hefted his stolen sword and aimed it up towards the woman. But the gesture did not even slow her as she came for him, face bare and held in a rictus of frenzy as she did. He was moments from using his final breath to order another retreat, but the order was belayed before he could voice it. A flash of movement, unnatural and smooth as the blue clouds of Samban 9. Sando shielded his eyes from the following sparks, sky shaded and bright and utterly blinding. Despite this, his heart swelled in sudden faith. Faith in his own survival, faith in victory, for the storm had finally parted, and his general had come. Hold your positions! Ayla ordered as she intercepted the winged warrior woman. The Twi'lek Jedi danced and spun, gravity's pull on her body little more than an annoyance to the lithe master. The Imperial, suddenly confronted by such a foe, began skating and scraping out a dance of her own. Jets belching and sputtering on her back as she used them to aid her mobility. They exchanged vicious blows, only stopping when the Jedi issued forth a pillar of invisible force into the sister, driving her back several feet. It was clear that the crazed cultist intended to dive right back into the fray, but she was brought up short, Ayla standing tall in brazen challenge as all around the Jedi Master, stacked in ranks upon the slope, were hundreds if not thousands of aimed blaster barrels, all pointing directly at the Imperial and her scant remaining sisters. Sando was standing over his general's right shoulder, sword held tightly in his right hand, blaster pistol clutched firmly in his left and aimed directly for the face of the sister of battle before them. Around her, the other sisters were being driven back to better cover, the fanatics being chased away, their withdrawal becoming little more than a hastened retreat as they were pursued by trails of overlapping blaster fire and molten dripping ceramite. The winged warrior scowled, the expression becoming a feral branding upon what may have been beautiful features. As Ayla raised her free hand, Soldiers of the Grand Army of the Republic, said the Jedi Master, Advance! 
The troopers opened fire, and the Imperial barely managed to activate her rockets quickly enough to launch herself back towards her own forces. On an arcing bow of smoke, crumbling armor, and bright blue blaster bolts. The final battle for Axum's reconquest would begin here, and it would begin now. Lazarus sat amidst the beds and hanging white linens of the medical triage tents. He was not in one, that privilege was reserved for the survivors of his mission, who lay and sat around him, groaning and gasping as they bore their many agonies. He had been in this setting before, but never like this. Most of the wounded were silent, some lost in prayer even as the sister's hospitalar moved between them, treating them with various drugs, medicines, and hooking them into life-saving machinery where it was required. But, in whatever state the wounded were in, the vast majority of them, or rather the ones with at least one eye remaining to them, if not both, kept those eyes firmly locked onto him. They acted as though he were the Emperor's own messenger, sent from his side with vital portents. Their expressions were hopeful, desperate, reverent, and filled with a religious infatuation that he had never once imagined falling on him. He was a soldier, a guardsman, the Emperor's hammer, not his word-bearer. Yet, in his hands, limply clamped between cold, numb fingers, was a certificate meant for his next of kin, his own death certificate. Columbia had been abandoned, most of its population coming with the Zectech fleet, while the remainder purposefully activated their planet's maligned lockdown in the hopes that the presence of the dead, frozen sphere would attract no unwanted Tyranid attention. However, even had the whole world packed up and left, Lazarus was the last of his line, the last of his name. But instead of being printed and burned, as would have been standard, the certificate was instead given to him, the waxy paper held limply in his hands as his eyes blankly scanned the faces around him. He'd been shot, almost point blank, with a bolt pistol. He died. And then, at the touch of the holy canoness, he had been restored to life, and since that moment, he had not spoken even a single word. The truth was, he had no words to say. He had returned feeling utterly empty, as though his soul was only slowly trickling back into his body, his mind still in shock. He had died in seconds of the blast, his heart halting from the shock of it and leaving him to experience only moments of his own death. That had proven painful, and painful far beyond his expectations of what dying of shock would have been like. But at least that had lasted only moments. Coming back, however, had been a whole different kind of hurt. The agony that had been poured over him, mind, body, and soul, as he was wrenched from Doom's rigid grasp and forced back into his body had been exquisitely unique, and the pain of it had devoured his every thought throughout. He did not doubt that many who watched him assumed that he was struck speechless by the majesty of the Emperor and his brief but potent time within the afterlife. The reality was that the trauma of coming back to life had stolen his language from him, and even as it came back into his mind, the former guardsman had no idea what to say, or even what to think. In a single day he'd gone from wearing the flak and fatigues of a sergeant to the carapace and uniform of a major, and now to what he was wrapped in. Stripped out of his former attire by the sister who had washed and tended his remaining wounds after his resurrection, he now wore bright white robes composed of bleached sackcloth, utterly unmarked and unmarred by any other addition save for the rough hemp belt which was tied around his waist. The garment was itchy and rough, but also light and clean. 
He was here to be watched for complications, but the sisters around him worked with utter faith that he had been saved, and were among the least likely to be caught staring at Lazarus, occupied by their own work. He had avoided speaking to any of them, to anyone at all. He knew they would ask him about what had happened and what he had seen and felt. Lazarus needed to be strong. He needed to stand so that the soldiers around him, now looking to him more than ever, could stand as well. He needed to give faith and strength to the warriors around him, even if he had little left for himself. But he knew that if he spoke, if he was asked to recall his experience, that he would be unable to remain unbent. He knew that he would falter and fall. And for a man who was chosen as a leader in war, this was simply not an option. He shifted his mind, instead choosing to focus on how grateful he was towards the canoness. Not for saving his life, though he did appreciate that as well, or rather, he knew he would eventually. No, he was grateful for her forceful assignment of him and his men to this duty guarding the medical camp which had been set up just behind the battle lines. Naturally, this meant that his soldiers had first access to its services, something they sorely needed. And though his least injured and most alert men were put to the first guard, all of his beleaguered soldiers found themselves with something hot to drink and warm to eat, if they could stomach it, which he knew they would. They were excellent soldiers, after all. Then Lazarus became aware of something, a tremble, an approach. He felt it through the floor and in the air, and then soon in the form of a commotion outside the tent. At first he had thought that the enemy were firing a new weapon, but soon realized it was coming from the wrong direction for that to be the case. The sound was too regular and growing louder too rapidly to be a weapon. A great mechanical roar shook the air, drawing unheard screams and cries from the soldiers around him. The earth trembled and then quaked as a vast, vaguely humanoid shadow swept across and over the tents. Medical implements falling to the ground as something huge leapt over them. Then it was passed and drawing further and further away. Oh, what in the feck was that? yelled a large Cadian who was strapped down to a medical bed and being attended by three hospitalar at once. The statement was soon echoed in thoughts and voices by nearly all inside the tent, though Lazarus would sit tranquil throughout. Victory, Lazarus said, drawing all eyes once he spoke. It is victory. He said again, for Lazarus knew that sound, though only from simulations. Murmurs and questions filled the time after his voice, but Lazarus did not speak again, and luckily for him, he did not need to. Minutes later, the tent flaps flew open and a scrawny Vestilin recruit clambered in, trembling from head to toe as he carried an unconscious wounded woman. He barely made it three steps before just as many sisters met him, two taking the woman from him wordlessly and laying her down on a nearby bed, while the third took him gently but firmly by the arm and led him to another place to rest. Hey, Vasti! A wounded Cadian corporal called from nearby. The man jerked his head nervously in her direction. Um, y yes? He asked. You... Ah, uh, feck! B burning throne, sister, that hurts! She groaned as the hospitalar at her bedside inserted a long needle into her. It'll hurt worse if you keep using that kind of language in here, Cadian. I'm almost certain you'll live, so appreciate this pain. The woman grimaced at the sister's pronouncement and redirected her attention to the new arrival. Did you get a good look at whatever it was that jumped over the camp? She asked. He nodded nervously. Well, spit it out then. She coaxed after a couple of seconds went by. Oh, uh, that's the night, the man muttered. The what? Uh, a night? 
An Imperial Knight? <laughs> I thought we lost all our local heavy support when they hammered into the auxiliary base. <laughs> the woman blurted out. Murmurs and excited chatter began to spread at those words. Everyone present who knew what an Imperial Knight was knew exactly what it could do for this fight. Lazarus himself had guessed as much from the sound of the thing and felt a greater elation sink into him at the confirmation. Yeah, the base fell. Our squad managed to find the pilot, though. Uh, most of us died getting her down there, but we did it. Lost the sergeant. Lost everyone but the rookie and the corporal. But we... The muttering man was cut off then as a cheer rose from the beleaguered soldiers around him. His eyes widened and he flinched back as though the mass of voice gratitude might strike him physically. That makes you lot a bunch of throne damned heroes! The Cadian declared, barely making her voice heard through the cacophony. The man looked around, his eyes still wide as he pressed his palms to his ears. Lazarus raised his hands, and in a few moments enough had seen to quiet the room. We'd been hoping for a Bane Blade, or any other super heavy support. A knight is a blessing from the Emperor himself. Take pride, guardsmen. You and your squad, alive or dead, have very likely saved this entire operation. The scrawny man blushed, his pale face reddening even more as the words were followed by the eyes and attention of everyone who could turn to see him. Honestly, I just operated the elevator. The real blessing was the lack of artillery fire. From how hard our base had been hammered at the start, I had been worried that we'd never make it more than five steps from the Mechanicus Temple before those distant cannons t -t turned us to dust. D don't know what they decided to fire on instead of us, B but I bet they chose wrong, the blushing soldier said sheepishly. The room around him silenced for a moment, all eyes staring a little more intensely at the man who seemed to notice and tense up himself. W what What'd I say? He asked a moment later, voice high-pitched. The room broke into laughter at that, and though the scrawny man had no way of knowing the joke, he soon began to laugh along with them nonetheless. Something's going on. Crosshair hissed from where he hid. <laughs> yeah, you think? Wrecker chortled, not far away, hiding behind a large statue of some kind of machine man. This one evidently venerated instead of being a slave. Quiet, both of you! Hunter snapped. They were all hiding, waiting. They had been traversing the bizarre temple, pausing to deactivate sensors and sneak around personnel, when suddenly and without apparent trigger, an alarm began to blare. The resonance of it made clear to the clones that it wasn't just blaring here, but all across the temple, maybe even across the whole ship. Naturally, they had taken cover and hidden, and not a moment too soon. As a veritable battalion of droid men, all rapidly marching in perfect synchronicity, entered the chamber they had been within. But no sooner had they entered than they crossed and exited once more. The phenomenon repeated itself again three more times before a general stillness settled upon the room once more. The alarm still blared, but in the absence of any more traffic, Hunter waved his men forward and it was not long before they found the access terminal within the room. Tech began to interface it with his data pad and the others gathered around, keeping watch. Fingers crossed. Crosshair said, and Hunter could only nod, kneeling with his rifle out as he waited. Time passed, but in the end, all the machine produced was a dissatisfied groan, voiced by Tech. Again? Wrecker asked, exasperated. Are we even in the right place? He added. He's got a point, Tech. You sure we're looking in the right place? Hunter asked. Tech crossed his arms and rubbed his chin. 
Yes, there's no doubt about it. Even if the control systems were not here, the access terminals in this place are comprehensive and widely tethered throughout the ship. In basic? Crosshair asked. It means that, even if it weren't here, the terminals would tell us where it is anyway, Tech said. Except they're not, Hunter added silently, and Tech nodded, frustration writ clear on his face. Look alive, Crosshair said. Single target, just came in through a maintenance hatch. He added a moment later, eyes fixed on his raised scope. Clone Force 99 took cover once more, hiding in the shadow of the pillars as the figure made his way closer and closer, going for the very same access panel they had been using only moments ago. The red-robed figure skulked, looking around suspiciously as though he were the one being hunted, though Hunter gathered that it was more likely he was using the alarm as a distraction to do something not so sanctioned of his own. And that gave him an idea. He crept down and drew his vibroblade, inching in from the man's blind spot. What are you doing? Crosshair hissed as he passed. Trying a different source. Hunter whispered back. Cover me, he ordered. His brothers did so, and soon Hunter was nearly directly behind the man. He was tapping and typing away frantically on the terminal's key interface, avoiding a direct link for some reason, despite the many mechanical tendrils he had about his covered body. Suddenly, the man paused and tensed, spinning around only to find the point of Hunter's knife in his face, and three other clones aiming weapons at him from over his shoulders. The hooded figure slowly raised its arms in surrender. Um, this isn't what it seems like? The man asked, oddly nonchalant about his words, which he voiced more like a question, clearly a terrible liar. His words were spoken in one of the new imperial languages, but Hunter's armor-mounted translator made short work of it and translated his own words back when he responded. And what does it not look like? He asked. The machine man seemed to cringe and shrug. I certainly was not fleeing confinement, and I also was not seeking a way to escape the subpar laboratory. The red-robed man said, a deserter's hesitance tainting his voice. Not that Hunter knew to recognize it. The sergeant shrugged. I don't care. We have questions we need answered. A bomb was placed on the fourth planet in this system, a planet cracker. We need access to its control systems, and I'm afraid I can't take no for an answer. The clone commando said, bringing his blade closer. The red-robed man paused, tilting his head curiously, though he kept his hands up. You're not lab security, are you? You're Republic Replicate! Infiltrators! Oh, then I take back everything I just said! I am definitely trying to escape this place, and I am certainly fleeing this disastrously insufficient excuse for a laboratory! This time, the clone found himself blinking in brief confusion. I told you, I don't care. Will you take us to the control system for the bomb or not? He asked. Oh, but you should care, the man said brightly. I'll gladly take you. I know exactly where it is, in fact. Your goal is on the way to where I myself am going. But in exchange, you must promise to help me make my appointment so that I can escape this place. If I am forced to produce even one more design for that ungrateful and uninspired disgrace upon the title of Magos, I'll seriously reconsider self-termination. Though, it would go against the lore to do such a thing. What's he saying? Wrecker asked. He's offering to show us where the bomb controls are in exchange for a ride out of here, I, I think. Tech explained. Hunter paused, looking at the man and considering his offer. The alarm was still blaring, and if the cause of it was not them or this man, then it was most likely General Skywalker. 
He was a mighty Jedi, no doubt about it, but even he could not take on the entire ship. They were running out of time, and a guide more sensible than a mindless trash droid would be more than useful, maybe even invaluable. Alright, fine. You lead us to the controls and help us get out of here, and we'll take you the rest of the way. He said, spinning his blade back and sliding it into his sheath. Agreed! The robed man said. The other clones looked at Hunter hesitantly, but lowered their weapons at a nod from him as he led the red-robed man back to them. This is a mistake, Crosshair muttered as he passed. Maybe, Hunter whispered back. So keep your trigger ready, he added. Crosshair nodded subtly and backed away, going to stand by Wrecker as the strange man came amongst them. Hunter turned to face him again and pointed with his thumb towards his own chest. Name's Hunter, by the way. Behind me is Tech, tall one is Crosshair, and the big one over there is Wrecker, he said, extending a hand towards the Imperial. The man stared at it in what seemed open delight for a couple of moments before taking it and shaking it, emulating Hunter's grip and posture perfectly. A pleasure to meet you, Hunter, Tech, Crosshair, and Wrecker. I am designated as Quo, Megos Quo 84, at your service. Tarweiler leaned against a broken, bent wall of metal. Once part of a building that had been reduced to nearly nothing by the searing touch of energy weapons. His black eyes shimmered in the deep shadow that was cut by the jagged arch of alien steel. Shielding him from the light and rain as he stood sentinel over the carnage around him. The clones fought like men possessed, and the Inquisitor knew that the sentiment was more than a metaphor having egressed from theatrics into the realm of distinct possibilities. But, be that as it may, they were being beaten back by Commissar Tyrandor and his accompanying forces. The near melee had been at a standstill for several minutes, but as mauled as the Commissar's numbers had been, these clones had clearly already been party to vicious fighting, and their coordination and discipline had begun to evaporate as fury conquered duty and exhaustion threatened imminence upon their entire army. The Imperium's forces were, by comparison, relatively fresh and ready for combat. And, apparently, this was all thanks to the acts of some new saint or hero who had revealed himself and martyred himself to save them from the dishonorable tactics of the Jedi. This and more he had learned from a medic who had tended to his injuries. A man referred to as Panic by the others around him. Despite the worrying moniker, the man had seemed remarkably calm and steady-handed, something even experienced medics often had trouble achieving when working on Tar's less personable visage. His mind could scarcely dwell on appreciating the man's nerve, however, before the guardsmen managed to retrieve Tar Weiler's rogue traitor. As was to be expected, the fool had come to them himself, insisting on being a part of the adventure whenever possible. So, he had been in the front row when his gun cutter had been blasted out of the sky. His heavy, scorched body was dragged out of the wreckage and towards the medics at an urgent pace, and it was easy to see why. Burnt from scalp to toenails, partially fused into his stylish and now half-molten flight suit, the man was a screaming, convulsing mess, and one which would be lucky to survive. Tar watched it all from his place under the bent wall, left alone as panic rushed to aid the more grievously wounded of the two, the Inquisitor feeling the cold of the rain he was drenched in for the first time, and shivering to the sound of blaster fire and death. He briefly considered rejoining the fight and lending his strength to the soldiers who had rescued him, but dismissed the thought. 
Omni, Kraden, and Jakal were still waiting within the outpost, which Tar had only barely managed to keep the guardsmen out of. His mind was smoking with frustration, his plan turning and adjusting into the circumstances. He'd need to contact his man at the Basilica of Salvation, Major Flecken. Tar doubted he would be able to covertly reach and disable the spaceport from his current situation, which meant the plan needed to accelerate. The very thought was fury itself. His plan had been so well executed until now, like dominoes carrying themselves to the ground, with only a touch here and a touch there required. But now, the pattern was flawed, and a more direct approach would need to be taken. He had planned on relying on the escalating situation to force the hand of the sisters who controlled the Basilica. In this, Major Flecken was vital, both as another subtle push, and as the hand himself should the need arise. And it appeared that it had. That hand he had prepared needed to be signaled to squeeze the trigger. The trigger on a weapon that would end the world and everything on it. But first, the timing had to be just right, and his exit needed to be secured. Already, Tar had predicted that the Republic's many naval forces would be arriving in the system shortly. If they had not entered from the beginning already. He needed to both ensure the weapon's activation and secure his own escape from the world before it fired. With his rogue traitor near death, his forbidden assets very nearly exposed, and his hand almost revealed, the Inquisitor knew that the task before him would be a tricky one, but one which was far from impossible for the likes of him. And his first step was to contact Major Flecken. He watched the medics toil over his friend for a time longer before slinking away and moving towards a communications officer. The man was relaying commands through the heavy Vox relay pack on his shoulders, kneeling behind the stationary form of a chimera and turned away from the battle as he did his duty. Tar stood over him at just enough of an angle that the man would catch his sharp, toothed face in the side view of his vision. The Inquisitor was already smiling, even before the man snapped his eyes back towards him, as Tar had expected he would. The officer almost hesitated in the stream of information he was relaying, managing to impress the monstrous Imperial servant who leered over him. In spite of Weiler's obvious rank and disturbing appearance, the man did not halt until his task was completed. He then pivoted, still on one knee, and saluted. Inquisitor, the surprisingly stalwart guardsman said, How may I serve? Can you reach the Basilica of Salvation with that setup? Tar asked. The man did not respond right away, first placing a hand against the heavy earpiece and speaker he wore on his head, his other hand manipulating the various knobs and switches on his Vox relay. After a few moments had passed, he gave a sharp nod. Yes sir, connection is viable. Good! Get me in contact with Major Flecken, right now! The Inquisitor demanded. The man nodded in response and began to dial in his Vox codes. Despite the fluidity of his actions, the Inquisitor could not help but notice how long the task was taking and how the man was forced to stop and verbally navigate with those of the Basilica. As he sought the Major, Tar felt the tightness in his gut long before the news arrived. I'm sorry, Inquisitor, the man said at last, but it appears Major Flecken is dead. He was assassinated by a Jedi witch earlier today. The news was like a slap in the face. How much had been slipping out of place while he had been absent? How on Terra had Flecken gotten himself killed? He had been instructed to stall the deployment of Imperial forces from the Basilica, so he should have been surrounded by fortifications. How by the Emperor had he managed to get himself killed even then? Tar shoved the thoughts aside. 
The task was now that much more difficult, and he needed to adjust accordingly. Without a man on the inside, he would need to rely on his original plan, that of creating a situation so dire, the Basilica's commanding authority would have no choice but to activate the temple's final failsafe. But it all needed to happen so much faster now. Get me in touch with Imperial Command at the Basilica. Anyone with authority who is not a part of the Ministorum or Sororita... The Inquisitor began to say. He was cut off when the Vox officer suddenly rose up and, with both hands, shoved Weiler back. With enough force to throw the Inquisitor... Tar was sent pitching across the broken street, caught totally off guard as he fell hard onto the tarnished floor. He released a less-than-human growl from his altered throat and curled into a sitting position in time to see the next attack coming. The Inquisitor rolled into a ball as he pitched himself backward, springing away in a gymnastic maneuver he had taught himself after watching a pair of Death Cult assassins earning their names. The springing withdrawal allowed him to evade maiming or death at the hands of the burning green sword which spun through the air, tearing molten furrows into the ground where Tar had just been laying. The Inquisitor landed in a crouch that saw his thin bladed black rapier drawn out into the faltering rain. He knew what he would find waiting for him even before his dark eyes met those of his attacker. A tan-skinned human Jedi leered from between a tangle of dreadlocks strewn across a grinning face. A single, yellow, tattooed line striping the bridge of the man's nose and underlining each of his intense, faintly yellow eyes. His extended hand was empty until the spinning blade of his light-based power sword returned to it with a snap. The Jedi was in his own crouch, blade held horizontally as it sizzled in the cold drizzle. Beneath and just behind the man was the bisected corpse of the Vox officer, who must have seen the man approaching, and saved Tarweiler's life at the expense of his own. At first, Tar had assumed he had been found by yet another Jedi in the same way as before, but this was proven false seconds later, as his eyes began to notice the descending bodies and blades of the Republic's Witch Knights. They glided down from on high by the powers of the warp, falling upon the guardsmen around them with swords of merciless, pitiless light. And, looking back into the eyes of his newest opponent, Tar could see that the warrior had drunken deeply of the warp's dark depths for they reeked of its maligned power. You look like someone important. <laughs> That's really very surprising, given how <laughs> inhuman you look, said the Jedi, slowly rising, lazily spinning his saber. Humanity is defined by the spirit more than by the flesh. Tar said, beginning to blur, preparing for battle. The Jedi shrugged, strolling to the left, away from the cover the Vox officer had been making use of, distancing himself from that impediment. If you say so. Now, listen well to what I say. Surrender. Right now. It's the only chance you'll get. I can promise you humane treatment. You, and whoever else joins you, said the light-wielding warrior. The Inquisitor laughed in response. And I invite you to take a knee and lay down your arms. I promise you a quick death if you do. Tar answered, his grin wide and monstrous. The Jedi shrugged again, though this time the movement was little more than a bob of his shoulders. All right, then I'm afraid I'm going to have to do to you what I've done to every other force wielder I found from your empire. Don't say I didn't warn you, he said, hopping lightly on his toes before beginning to close with Tar. 
The Inquisitor swept his sword out in open challenge before driving in point first. The blow appeared physical, yet it was nothing but a mask, a veneer covering the true strike beneath it. As his blade moved forward in its predictable path, Tar lobbed forth an invisible javelin of screaming energy towards the Jedi. A bolt of concentrated suffering and sorrow Tar had drawn and saved from his most bedraggled victims. The Inquisitor could see the moment his hidden attack connected, well ahead of the pointed pinnacle of his bladed lunge. The Jedi had fallen into a lower stance once more, Blade prepared to parry when his expression rippled, changing like the surface of a previously still pond, going from a smirk of assured confidence to a look of sudden shock. And just like that, Tarweiler had the fool! Or so he thought. But the man's blade continued its parry, his feet shuffling with coordinated intent before he moved in, not away. The lithe, lethal form of the Jedi adopted bizarre, precise movements which gracefully turned the Inquisitor's blow aside, almost pulling him past the warrior's dervishing body, leaving him more and more exposed. The challenger released his burning sword of light, catching it in his other hand as he continued to twist, snapping the blade out of the air and swinging it across Tarweiler's lunging body. The Inquisitor's warp-accelerated mind struggled to understand the feint, to understand how the man had taken his lance of pain without so much as stumbling. The Jedi's shocked expression melted in the course of a second, becoming a wicked grin of born teeth and triumphant, fiery eyes. Eyes which shone between dark dreadlocks like flames within the abyss. The change snapped Weiler back to his instincts in the final second, twitching his thoughts in a last hope, activating a medal on his chest which doubled as a safety device. It was meant for avoiding ranged attacks predominantly, and using it like this was dangerous. But he had no time to even think, barely any time to activate it. The blade connected with Tar's side, scorching the man and biting into him effortlessly. Then, there was a flash, and the Inquisitor was gone, reappearing in the same instant, upside down and five feet in the air, to the left of where they had begun. He barely had the sense to catch himself, rolling into a low crouch and hissing, body dripping still, despite the death of the rain. He clutched his side, the two and a half inch wide cut there becoming a brand of pure agony, though it had been cauterized shut. The sun began to cut beams of light back into the sky, making the black-eyed Imperial squint as the Jedi stood, blade flourishing in his stance, grin still widely displayed as he reoriented on the Inquisitor. Tar grit his teeth, but was nonetheless thankful that he had been repositioned in the air and not into the floor beneath them. Had he tried that in a room with a ceiling? Ah, slippery, aren't you? The Jedi said. How did you do that? The Inquisitor snapped in response. My mind, Lance. How did you... What did you do? He demanded again. Huh, mind, Lance. Oh, you mean your little dark side magic just now? <laughs> I assume this means you haven't encountered Vapad before. The man said as he drew closer. The Inquisitor tried to rise, but the pain from his saber wound almost drew the waking world out of him, and he was forced to remain on his knees, barely able to move at all. He kicked back and away as best he could, though the Jedi kept pace with him casually. Uh, Vapad! The Inquisitor spat. The Jedi nodded. Yup, Vapad. I'm not even all that good at using it, but it's enough. He said before halting suddenly. 
The Inquisitor kept scrambling back, and when he was not pursued, he looked around half expecting to find a Grox bearing down on him. Instead, Commissar Tarandor strode towards Tarweiler's fallen form, dropping a stem pack into the Inquisitor's lap as he passed the man, chainsword held forward with one hand, drawing a last pistol with the other. Enough for two, I hope. The Commissar said, revving his chainsword as Tar took the stem pack and jammed it into his thigh. The Jedi still smiled, though his eyes had hardened and the turn of his lips had become less triumphant and more vicious as his kill was interceded. Tar Weiler was panting, feeling heat flaring up from his injected leg and filling the rest of his body with a pulsating, numbing flame. I'll see what I can do for you," the Jedi said as he began to circle to the left again. Inquisitor, Tarandor said, voice tight. You need to escape. I have a modified Chimera waiting for you further up the road. They have your pilot stabilized in sight. Take it and run, the Commissar said. Tar scowled and slowly stood, wincing from the damage at his side and working some of his warp arts over the wound. He was hardly an adept healer, but it was better than nothing, and killing the nerves near the worst of the damage would help him fight. Jakal and Omni Kraden were still waiting for him inside the outpost, and so turning back now was not an option. Negative, Commissar. You've saved my life twice now. I will not let that debt mature any further. Tar growled as he called his fallen rapier back into his hand, and staggered into line beside the red and black garbed Imperial Commander, raising said weapon. Formidable though he may be, we can defeat this witch together. The Inquisitor added, <laughs> You wouldn't put any credits on that if you had any sense. I've tangled with Sith Lords, Jedi Hunters, and surprisingly spry bounty hunters. Yet here I stand. And I'll even let you in on one little secret. As scary as I may be, I'm not the only one who can use Vapor. Hell, I'm not even the best one at it. Not even close. The Jedi boasted, shoulders laid back in a casual posture. And I'll tell you another. You'll never see the blades of either of the two Jedi who can beat me at this game. Because you stop playing. Right here. Right now. Saffron felt himself fading. His consciousness wavering even as he contended with the remaining Jedi. He was so close. So close, he knew he should withdraw, should find solace, yet his enemy was all but vanquished, and he would not return to his master with words of retreat. There was no retreat, there was no surrender. Saffron would not allow himself to fail this creed, but even so, fury and frenzy would not be enough to carry him through. He took a defensive stance, allowing the Jedi to come to him instead of he to them. Using both hands, he held his stave wide, catching their strikes and measuring their movements. Both were wounded and slowed by their injuries, but none more than Saffron himself, who felt the blood vessels in his eyes bursting as he strained to remain mobile. Obi-Wan was carrying a limp, his healed shin still evidently ailing him as he tried to stand on it, and Mace Windu was burned, with small clumps of painfully molten but hardening metal fused into spots on his robe and skin. Most of the Jedi had escaped by now, but even so, if Saffron could crush these last two, their order would follow. If not literal truth, then in spirit. But he was fighting with just one heart, and with two of his lungs pierced and filling with blood. It oozed from his mouth and out of his wound, and even then the only thing that kept him upright was his telekinesis. Inside the bloody hole left by the saber which had pierced his heart, he forced the mostly ruined muscle to continue beating. 
painfully massaging it with his powers while capping the holes as best he could. It was the roughest of patches, but it sufficed with the help of his second heart to keep him upright. Having three lungs saved him from suffocation, but only just. The result was a man who needed to use all his psychic focus to keep himself from dying of heart failure, all the while dueling two skilled but wounded opponents. The fight would not last much longer now. Obi-Wan came in high, Mace Windu low. In response, Saffron attacked Obi-Wan, relying on the warrior's instinct to drive him back back into the defensive once he saw the stave being swung towards him, intending for Kenobi to dodge away. It happened just as Saffron had predicted, with the Jedi abandoning his attack to bend backwards, choosing to evade in place of parry or block to spare his wounded shin. Harnessing that momentum, Saffron pivoted, continuing the swing to intercept with Mace Windu while sweeping with his left leg aiming that one for Kenobi. Again, the Jedi Guardian avoided the strike, though Mace did not avoid his. Catching the blade on a hard-locking block, the Bald Master pushed and Saffron gave way, knowing that Kenobi was still recovering from avoiding his leg sweep and therefore isolating Windu for a few precious seconds. Saffron held his breath, blood gushing in a sudden torrent from his mouth and wound as he released his hold, redirecting his psychic force into acceleration, trading a rapid flurry of blows with Windu before Obi-Wan could step in again. He lay into the Jedi, but the Master did the same, expressing strength far beyond what was natural as he met blade with stave and gauntlet with fist. Saffron felt his sight flickering, his reflexes slowing in spite of himself. Go down! Windu bellowed, agony ripe on his features as his skin and muscles flexed against the fused bits of metal across his body, tearing and blistering, filling him with as much pain as exasperation. Saffron sneered, but the expression fell away as Obi-Wan joined in. He retracted his speed and Windu backed off with a hard gasp, allowing Kenobi to step back in. The librarian nearly swooned, clenching his staff hard to bring back his focus, hammering down on the Jedi Master but unable to breach what remained of his defenses before Mace drove in again. The Space Marine decided then to focus on Windu, the one who had dealt so much damage to him already. Is this the best you can do? Here I stand, heartless, lungs full of blood, and weary of a day from slaughtering your pathetic order, and still you struggle. What hope have you, if this is all you have to offer? Saffron mocked. Obi-Wan ignored the remark completely, falling into serenity, but not Mace Windu. Though he did not respond directly with his words, his anger grew and he pressed in harder. The epistolary grinned, seeing his chance beginning to emerge. They exchanged a few more blows before both parties backed off, each man barely on their feet. Ah, oh, too weak to finish the task at hand. The space marine panted through deadly exhaustion. I don't see you putting an end to this task either, said Mace Windu, eyes blazing, becoming twin rings of fiery light. To his surprise, the Marine laughed, loud and exaggerated, extending his arms toward the smears and bodies which remained all around them. Blood seeped from between his teeth, coloring his chin as he made the hideous sound and spread his legs a bit more wavering only slightly. <laughs> then you should look closer, Jedi. I've been ending tasks like you all day. He boomed. Windu gripped his saber and raised it, eyes wide with unrelenting rage. He roared and charged forward, not waiting or signaling to the recovering Obi-Wan. Master Windu, wait! 
Kenobi yelled, but it was too late to stop him. Mace charged in and forced Obi-Wan to follow, half-cocked. Saffron grinned a brilliant red smile and threw himself toward them, meeting the two warriors halfway, surprising both. Again, Obi-Wan fell into his defensive instincts, and Mace fell into his offensive ones. Saffron knew he had but one chance to finish this quickly, or his endurance would fail before the Jedi did. He exchanged another flurry of blows with the Jedi Master, but this time, as Windu's companion made to rejoin the fight, Saffron intentionally exposed himself for a strike. It was a trap and one he feared would be too obvious, but true to his aggression, Mace Windu seized on it the instant he could. The Corrin Master bellowed, voice dripping in vicious desire as he plunged his purple blade into Saffron's armor, piercing it over the Marine's right rib plate and burning through it with the blow, lancing his already wounded lungs once more. But before Mace's blade arm could be withdrawn, it was suddenly locked, seized by Saffron's left fist, the librarian releasing his stave altogether, one hand grasping Mace's forearm and holding him there, while the other hammered down to pulp the master's head. No! Obi-Wan cried, moving faster than he'd ever had before, faster than he ever moved since, blade falling from his own hands as he threw himself into a lunge, tackling Mace from the left and throwing the both of them out of the way, wrenching Mace's arm painfully out of Saffron's grip, breaking it. Yes! Saffron roared triumphant as he followed the trajectory of the two with his eyes. Denied their footwork, blades, and defense, Saffron took his chance and relinquished his telekinetic heart once more in order to extend his hands out, issuing forth a torrent of demonic lightning which spilled from his hand and towards the Jedi. Kenobi hit a pillar with Master Windu still in his arms, attempting to rebound and escape away, but his weakened shin failed to support him, and the hesitation born from that doomed them both. Kenobi and Windu began to scream as the sneaking bolts of warp power caught them, beginning to cook the two of them alive. Obi-Wan curled and flailed, trying to crawl away but losing all control of his body. All the while, Saffron laughed, adding his other hand, roasting the Jedi as he did so. It lasted all of five seconds and then stopped abruptly. There was a flash and an odd sound that neither Saffron nor the other Jedi had ever heard before. Kenobi was surprised to find himself still alive and breathing, gasping out a puff of smoke and, with trembling exertion, looking up towards his assailant. There he stood, tall and confused, blinking as he stared first at his now powerless hands and then down lower, the nearly foot-wide hole that had appeared in his chest. Without falling, but beginning to falter, the Marine turned around to look behind himself, only to grunt loudly as another brilliant fount of energy emerged from behind him and struck him again, growing the hole even wider, leaving no room for his two hearts or three lungs in the empty, burnt space that was his chest. This did force Saffron to his knees, the marine collapsing like a puppet with his strings cut, barely staying up on his hands. An enormous gout of chemical-smelling blood drooled from his mouth and began to well thickly around his wound. Still, he saw with clear eyes the face of his killer, the old woman. She had assembled some kind of melta gun behind his back, the one with a range that far surpassed any he'd yet seen. She stood there, weapon raised and sighted as though she would shoot him again, though after a second or two she looked up from the leveled gun. Well, well done, Saffron croaked. Name, <laughs> he added, 
choking on blood and a lack of oxygen. In response, she raised one of her gray eyebrows. Windu stood up at that moment, cradling his broken arm and walking towards them, standing over the fallen Astartes and releasing his wounded limb, calling his saber to his hand, activating it and lifting it. Wait, said Jocasta, and with great difficulty, Mace held his blade raised, but still. Your name? I would know it, the Marine said, pushing air up his ruined throat with the power of the warp. I am Jedi Master Jocasta Nu. Take my name to your god and pray he does not force me to send more of you with it, said the rigid old woman. Saffron laughed, making a horrible sound which forced him to vomit forth a whole pool of unnatural blood. Are you master among these... these... Jedi? He panted, arms trembling. She shook her head no, though he could no longer see her, only hear her. I am chief librarian of the Jedi Order, she said to the dying man. The words seemed to shock him, but then he smiled one last time and began to laugh again, first with what little false air he had left to push into his vocal cords, and then silently as he lost the strength to continue. He looked up at her, eyes blood red, all the vessels having burst. He mouthed something to her, having no power left to give air to his words, and then gradually fell still. Mace waited and then slowly lowered his blade, stepping away from the mountainous corpse of the Astartes. His eyes did not leave the dead man, reaching out with his mind to confirm his death yet was rebuffed by the ambient wards which persisted in the librarian's armor. What did he say to you? Mace Windu asked Master Jocasta Nu. She grimaced and raised the barrel of her weapon towards the dome ceiling, convinced the marine was dead at last. She looked at Mace, though he did not look back. He said, Stifle that guttering flame of hope, for I am not alone and I am not the greatest of my brothers. Two more stand above me, and they shall teach you the lesson I could not, said Jocasta Nu. Mace turned then, finally looking away from the Marine. Did he say what that lesson was? He asked her. The wizened librarian nodded stiffly. Mace waited, but she did not speak right away. Instead, she looked from him to an empty space on a distant wall, seeming grayer and older than he had ever seen in that moment. And? he asked Master Nu. She snapped her eyes back to him and straightened. His lesson was, hope is the first step on the road to disappointment. <laughs>